get working on this. Of course, as we were talking earlier, I, I had my uh, books with me and so forth down at John's this week, and Jude would play along, and I and I mean he he entertains himself most of the time, and so I was able to study and to read some different things, and and I'm, I was just like. <laughs> what do you say about this? I mean, we all know this story. We all know the flow of this. But but I, I got to thinking about the fact that that it's not Easter now, and we're, we're studying this. And I think that's a good thing. When I was a teenager, I used to say that I wished our preacher would do a Christmas series, would teach on Christmas in the summertime. When our minds are not filled with all the things we got to do at Christmas and all the extra cantatas and your Christmas programs and you got to go here and eat and there and eat and the other place and eat and your mind is so full with all the things you got to do that we really I don't think stop and focus on the real story. We we need to be told that story at a time outside its normal setting in order to really. Uh, focus on it and the same way with with the passion story we we so often only talk about it during easter season or you know and that that's so short unless your church um uh celebrates lent the lenten season or unless you have holy week services it just you know palm sunday and easter and that, that's about all you get of it and 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 bless the poor pastor's hearts who try to cram everything in to just two two sermons but um, we just don't get to cover it all, especially not verse by verse, the way that, that we do it. If you were with us when we studied Matthew's gospel, you may remember that, especially for this portion of the story, we looked at it as picture and fulfillment. We looked at a lot of the Old Testament prophecies and their fulfillment as Matthew shared them with us how the, the pictures of the sacrificial system of the Old Testament corresponded to what Jesus was doing and saying during that what we call Holy Week. Things like uh, Palm Sunday, which we actually could call the choosing of the Lamb Day. Because on that very day, on Nisan 10, all the people in Jerusalem were choosing their lambs for their Passover celebration later in the week. During that week, as everybody was cleaning their house of, of all the leaven in the house, every bit of leaven had to be cleaned out, Jesus was over in the temple cleaning house as well. And we went through several of those things that we, we picked the picture and the fulfillment. We, uh, one that really intrigued me was that as the priest in the sacrificial system, both in the Old Testament and what was going on in Jesus' day it, it, during that very time in that sacrificial system, the priest would actually lay their hands on the sacrifice to symbolically transfer the sin of the people whom the priest represented, lay the sin to the people on the lamb. And we saw how when Jesus was in, not only in, in Ananias' house, but also in Caiaphas' house, how they took turns hitting him. And the pre, and especially in Caiaphas's house, that second um, uh, trial, which really uh, John doesn't cover, but in that trial, it was the priests who were hitting Jesus, and in that, they were laying their hands on him and symbolically transferring their sin to the sacrifice. I mean, there, there was so much more of that as we came down to the last hours of Jesus' life, we talked about having a split screen. You know, if you're watching sports on TV and uh, particularly something like NASCAR or, or, or something where the, the action is continuous and they go to commercial, they have a split screen where they have the action going on and then they have the, the commercial over here. Or if it's a ball game, a football game, they may have a split screen on you know, the defense and then on the offense and you see things happening at the same time. But we talked about that split screen and and how uh, it corresponded the things that was happening to Jesus on the cross and actually during that time of his death and what was happening in the temple at the same time. Corresponding the same moments. That, that, that was a fascinating study. 
But that's uh, but John John doesn't John doesn't cover that. John doesn't approach this portion of the story that way. We say why? Well, remember Matthew was a Jewish man writing for Jewish believers. The Jewish believers, as Matthew introduced Jesus as the Messiah, as the coming king, as the sacrifice, he would have to bring out those sacrifices. They would have to see them on that split screen. And they would understand that. John, on the other hand, as we remember, although John's a Jewish man, he's writing some 60 years after the crucifixion. And the believers reading John's gospel would be Gentiles as well as Jews. And actually, as we, we've seen during this study, John shares more about the feasts and the festivals. The, I mean, he names them. We see the three Passover feasts. John tells us when they are. So we can gauge Jesus' ministry by the year. John talks about the, the feast of uh, uh, tabernacles. He talks about the Feast of Dedication, which we know is Hanukkah. John talks about all these things. John talks about all that stuff that took place in Jerusalem early in Jesus' ministry that the other Gospels don't talk about. But John is so keyed in on, on sharing that that he, uh, he knew that the other Gospel writers, those reading those Gospels, would mentally automatically insert those things into the story because they knew when they happened. These people, if John had not told them, would not know. And we are so thankful for John for us, because we wouldn't know if John didn't insert those things into the story. We wouldn't understand it, so John shared it. And so, too, for this, this portion of the crucifixion story, John takes a different approach. As I said last time, I wish that the last lesson and this one could be taught back to back because it's all one single thing that's happening probably within less than an hour's time frame. And I'll pick up some of that to flow it back in to see how it goes. So as we begin, I'll try to connect that story back together. But let's look at the overview first. As you read this, and again, this extremely familiar portion of story what did you notice that you didn't realize that John doesn't tell us what what, what about it does John share that you're like wait he doesn't tell this and he doesn't share that we've talked about that in all the other lessons but for this portion of it what did you see or ha have you read this uh this, this intense portion of scripture and, and how did it affect you? Well, anything you want to share about this? You know this camera just picks up the clock ticking when nobody says it. <laughs> I was kind of amazed how John Pilate tried so many times to say, hey, he is. This yep. is your king. Why are you doing this? Yeah. And he's not guilty, and I really wish I could turn him loose. Yeah. Over and over and over. Yeah. yeah. I almost felt sorry for him. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if sorry is the right word, but. He's in a predicament. Right. I mean, and, and, and in all fairness, he probably got himself into that predicament, but still, a predicament nonetheless. Well, Exactly. In fact, I think I put that on one of my notes. He's between a rock and a hard place. Exactly. What else? The cruelty is always shocking. Oh, yeah. No matter how many times you read it, it's just like raw. Yeah. The cruelty. That's, that's why I said, you know, it's an intense portion of Scripture. And not only is it intense as it's written, but it leaves out so many details that our minds fill in because we know what these things mean. Yeah, it's just, it, it's raw. What else? Um, 
what you read. The Holy Spirit hadn't come at this time. No. And the people, that's, that's what goes through my mind, that the people... Uh, was there no kindness? Was there no empathy? Some people, you know, may have, but these are religious leaders. Mm -hmm. and, and to be that angry at, at a man mm -hmm. that had done nothing but good they were afraid of their position. Yeah. And that, that just, I don't know. That, that, is, that is so shocking. And I, I read some things on that this week. Um, I, I've got some stuff in my notes that I really didn't use. But th there are, and, and you all may have read things like this too, there are studies that have been done where, um, you, you put a group together in a situation and and expose them to pain or anger and they feed on one another. You, you, you understand you know what I'm saying? I don't know if you've seen the movie The Lord of the Flies. Uh, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's an old, old movie. I haven't seen all of it. I've seen bits and pieces of it. But as I remember... If I remember correctly, the, the way that it goes, um, these uh, young boys were on, on a, uh, a ship, and it shipwrecked. I think the adults were killed. Or so. is, that, is that right, Amy? Do you, have you seen it? You read the book? The book would, be, would have been much more intense, I'm sure, than, yeah. than the movie. But, you know, correct me, because I, I just have a vague memory of that. The adults died, and, and the boys... Yeah, they were all on the island. With yeah. And, and there began to be a hierarchy. One, you know, one became sort of the leader of the group, and then they um, um, began, uh, I don't know, torturing, or I don't know, I, I don't remember everything. But anyway, they became very, what's the word, uh, cruel, barbaric, yeah, to one another. And, you know, and we we would like to think. As Christians with the Holy Spirit, we would never succumb to something like that. And we just pray we'd never be in a situation where we are in a cruelty. But but we, we get numbed to things even now, don't we? Are we not numbed to the, some of the things we see on TV? We watch a news report, and I think the main reason they only give 15 seconds to some of these horrible things is, is so... It goes right on into the commercial where everybody's happy, and, and, and that gets pushed back. I kept trying to see how the guards were at liberty to be so cruel. Yeah, you know, they didn't get orders given to them except to flog him. Yeah, you know, but they were just they were just vicious. Think about those Roman soldiers, though, when they are at home in Rome. What is the number one spectator sport? The arena. The arena. People get killed by yeah, animals. Everybody, anybody seen Gladiator, Russell Crowe, Gladiator? The animals come out and they watch that. And so they get desensitized to it. It's just, it's, it's hard for us just to imagine, though, somebody reaching that point. But they, that's, that's what they were. These, these Jews were to the Roman soldiers just, they were there on assignment and duty and they were just like less than human people. So it's, it's, it's hard to read that and to really understand what's really going on. What else, anything else on, on reading this? It, did, it, did it raise any questions? Only how could it ever happen to start with? How could it ever happen to start with? How, how could depravity of man sink that far? Mm -hmm. Especially in the Jewish leaders because they're right. supposed to be the holy leaders. Yeah, yeah. supposed holy to be the holy leaders. Yeah. Right. We could really go off on a tangent with that, couldn't we? Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> Anything else on that? On just reading through? I think this is the first time that I noticed that uh, the Jewish leaders called Caesar their king. Yeah. Yeah. I was I was believe it. Yeah. They wanted rid of Jesus so badly. I, you don't know whether they got caught up in the emotion of the moment and that came out or what the reasoning behind that was, but they hated him so badly that they were willing to do that. Yeah. Well, I hope uh, as you were preparing for this lesson, and since we've been off a week for fall break, I hope you went back and read chapter 18 or at least especially the last portion so we can could bring it up and I'm not going to obviously go all over it again but, but just to connect it back up we saw that it began as the Jews after three Jewish trials remember Jesus was under six trials all six of them were illegal or had Ill illegal components to them three Jewish trials and three civil trials or, or uh, under, uh, under Gentiles they uh, they had taken Jesus to Pilate. The uh, the temple guard had taken Jesus to Pilate, where they apparently expected Pilate to just rubber stamp their sentence. We we get this feeling of I mean nothing is said about it, but we get this feeling of there being a prior arrangement. It reads like it, they expected it to go like this, and it didn't go like this. So they bring. Uh, Jesus uh, to Pilate. Pilate, however, didn't follow the expected plan. And in verse 29 of, of chapter 18, um, they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium, and it was early, and they themselves, um, well, yeah, I, that's 28, verse 29. So Pilate, therefore, went out to them, but they wouldn't go in, and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? And they were like, this caught them off guard. According to John's account of it, verse 30, they began sort of sputtering. And da, 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 da. He's a bad man. We would have never brought him. He wasn't a bad man. And it just like catches them off guard. We know, however, that in Luke 23, verse 2, the actual charges are laid out. And we see it, they, they, they bring forth three charges. And then a little later, then they'll bring forth another charge. And it's just like they keep throwing these things out, hoping something will stick. And so, so they bring these three charges. But as we saw, the Jews changed the charge that they had charged Jesus with, blasphemy, changed that, and they accused Jesus of insurrection, inciting the people to re refuse to pay taxes, and that he himself, remember the pronouns together, he himself claimed to be the Messiah, a king. They keep throwing these things out. Maybe one of them, maybe Pilate will, will charge him with one of those. They did this thinking that Pilate wouldn't care if Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. That was the blasphemy charge. And normally Pilate wouldn't care because Rome had what he was um, familiar with in his growing up. Rome had a, a plethora of, of gods and goddesses, and, and there were the Greek gods and goddesses and the Roman gods and goddesses, and everywhere there was a god for everything and temples everywhere, and it blasphemed our god. And he would be like, so? You know, it's just one more god. We'll see as we go along that that becomes a little bit more intense but they, they think he's not going to care about that, and so they change the charge to something that he would care about. And during this examination, we saw that Pilate begins to see through the Jews' scheme, and he actually begins to realize that Jesus is innocent. I don't think he really cared one way or the other. I mean, this personal opinion. I don't think he cared one way or the other to start with. I think he did this. I think he started this out as just sort of a way to, to uh, agitate the Jews. I mean, he he knows in the beginning. He thinks, oh, I'm just gonna I'm going to give in eventually, but I'm gonna have a little fun with them to start with. I'm, I may have to do this, but they're gonna have to work for it. But then he actually begins to see that no, 
this man is innocent. And so that puts him in a dilemma, like we said, between a rock and a hard place. So he tries, as we saw many times, in many ways to get out of crucifying Jesus. First of all, he tries to dodge the responsibility. Oh, he's from Galilee? Let's send him to Herod. Well, that'll take care of it. We, see, we have to see that in Luke's gospel. So he sends him to Herod Antipas. That doesn't work. Herod doesn't find anything deserving of death, and he sends him back to Pilate. And so Luke tells us that Pilate then announced that he would, as we read in Luke's version, punish him and release him, but that doesn't work either. Offering that doesn't work. And so the next thing Pilate tries, under the guise of tradition, is he offers, he knows he's going to have to offer somebody to be set free. And so he picks the one man that he never thought in a million years the Jews would go for releasing Barabbas. But they do. Matthew and Mark both tell us that Pilate knew that the Jews were stirring up the multitude in asking for Barabbas out of jealousy. Now, uh, you and I think of the word jealous and and. Uh, we just think it like it, it, at worst it's coveting or it's wanting something somebody else has or or we think of kids, you know, one's jealous of the other, they get more attention. We don't think of it as being such an intense word. But the, the better word there, literally, the word literally means a malicious spite. That was that was the reason they did that. But again, Pilate never never expected them to actually agree to that. But they did. And so that brings us to chapter 19 of John. And, and here is where John differs a little from the other Gospels. Not only in the dialogue between Pilate and Jesus, but in the, in, in the, uh, uh, in the sequence of the events. In the other three Gospels, and I, I actually, am in one of my notepads here, I, I took the, the all four Gospels and made me lines and charts and wrote down what they did so I could, sometimes I've been known to put those in spreadsheets. <laughs> but I didn't do that this time. But so I can have it right in front of me, you know? This one said this, this one, so I'm, you know, thumbing back and forth. But but he, 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 he wants to, to deal with this. In, in a way that that carries it through, but he wants out of it, but yet he, he can't get out of it. One of them lost my... Okay, I, I had lost my train of thought there. It's Joseph still training it. In, in the other three Gospels, the way the sequence of events flows in the other three Gospels. After Barabbas is released, Jesus is turned over to the soldiers and taken to crucifixion. None of this dialogue that we have in John is shared. It's just straight from releasing Barabbas, straight to the scourging, and then on to the crucifixion. But John said that Pilate had one more, one last, idea. He had one more thing up his sleeve to try to turn Jesus loose. And so that brings us to our questions. Verse 1 of chapter 19, I asked the question, what did Pilate do? And obviously it wasn't Pilate doing it. Pilate was having it done. And, and verse 1 of chapter 19 says, then Pilate therefore took Jesus, and, and I can imagine it's not necessarily a, uh, you you want to you want to come over here and go with with these fellows? It wasn't that way at all. Pretty roughly, turned him over to the soldiers, and then the soldiers were the ones who scourged him. They took him and had him scourged. But what what really surprised me as I was reading that is how matter of factly, or how straightforward this is. Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him, or had him scourged. I mean, it's just, you know, I, I, I say this a lot, I know, but the, I always think of the old dragnet program, you know, just the facts. I mean, that's always just the facts. 
But this, this carried so much more meaning. We, we aren't given the details in any of the Gospels of what being scourged entailed. Just like when we get to the crucifixion, if, if you do your spreadsheet and you do all four of them, what it says about the crucifixion, it just simply says, and he was crucified. Or they had him crucified. If you did not grow up in the church, if you had never heard these stories, you would have a clue what that meant. What what, what they do to him? They, they must have done something to him. But we wouldn't know. But because we do know, our minds fill in those details. If, if you've been around Bible studies or Easter messages for any length of time, or you saw the passion of the Christ, then you know what being scourged means. When we, like I said, when we read he was crucified, our minds automatically fill in the details. But what about scourging? What do you know about scourging? If you saw the passion of the Christ, what was it? Or how would you how would you explain? Well, my translation says scourging. You may say flogging. How would you explain that to someone who didn't know what that meant? Whipped. Whipped. How? Well, it was a specific type of lash. Right. It had three prongs on the end of it. So it was tearing flesh. It was, the, the prongs were, sometimes had bits of bone, bits right. of metal, pit, bits of uh, stone that had been sharpened. It, it actually, uh, this this thing was kind of like you and I would take a, a broom handle and uh, these were attached to the ends. What else would, uh, I don't want to give you up. What else? What else would you sh- would you share about that? In verse 39 that is, we'll talk about that in a minute. That's a Jewish form of flogging. The Romans, they could go on as long as they wanted to go. They didn't keep count. How was he dressed? They took off all his clothes. All his clothes, yeah. I don't remember if if I, if I've read. I mean, I I have read it, but I don't remember if, I, if it was this way. I've only seen that movie once, but uh, um, what I've read is it's there's a, a like a uh, pole, and they would lean them lean the person across them and attach their hands to the bottom of it so that they're bent over this and sometimes there would be two and these these men were professionals you, you imagine that what do you do for a living and they would take turns flashing back and forth and, and like we said there was no count to it they could go on as long as they wanted to go on any other Thing you want to share on anything that you know about that? This sounds like you could die from that. You could. That you could dangerous. actually die. And that's why they had, quote, professionals, because they knew exactly how much they could do. They could tell when a person was nearing death and when they needed to stop. A lot of times they would pass out and they would they would pour water on them to revive them. But but there was that fine line of how close they could get without actually killing them. As I said in your lesson, uh, scourging was only supposed to be administered after a criminal was sentenced. And and before crucifixion, those two things went together. According to John's account, not only was this before Jesus was sentenced, but he'd actually been declared innocent several times before this. And so everything about what happened there was illegal. According to F.F. F. Bruce and William Barclay's commentaries, flogging wasn't used as a punishment by itself. It was always in conjunction with crucifixion. Now, there are other commentaries that disagree on that, so I'm, you know, I'm not saying that definitively, but those two commentaries said that it was always in conjunction with uh, crucifixion. Uh, the Jews, Amy, the Jews also had a form of flogging 
And, and I use that use the word flogging instead of scourging because it doesn't quite sound as bad as scourging. Deuteronomy 25.3 states that, that um, times that it would be used, but it states that it shall not be more than 40 lashes. And the Jews, you know how the Jews are, they always want to be so adamant that they don't break the law that they never did it more than 39 times, just in case they missed one and miscounted and made them break the law. But this was different. Roman scourging was different. As I said, this was done by a professional. And there were no restrictions on how many lashes a man would receive. And, and in fact, it was designed to weaken a man almost to the point of death for a couple of reasons. One, to lessen his ability to resist crucifixion. He, he was so weak at that point, he couldn't fight back. And also to hasten the death once he's on the cross. If you, if you take a, a healthy person and you nail them to a cross, and, and, and we'll talk about the cross later, but we have different depictions of different commentaries give you different ideas of what the cross looked like and how it was. But if it is, like we've seen in many cases where you know, they're, they're, the, the uh, nail goes through the wrist part so it holds the hands up and through the, the ankles, but many times we see pictures where there's a little ledge either under their feet or where they can all kind of prop on uh, under their seat. Whether it's that or not, but a healthy person crucified like that and they can raise themselves up to be able to breathe and then when they get tired, let down until they can't breathe anymore. A, a healthy person can go on without food and water for days. And so this scourging brought them right up to the point, so a max of a day or two, a, a, a second day at the most. And they, they really didn't expect them to last that long. And there's, as we said, there's a lot of gory details that we could share, but you've probably heard what, what scourging can do to the human body and uh, how it can cause shock and the blood loss and, and all those things. I mean, there, there's no... I don't see a need in, in going into that detail. Y'all been in charts long enough that you've heard all of that or you've seen the movies. But but I do want to share this, and this might be a little bit out of a little bit of a rabbit trail, but I, this beating, this this scourging that Jesus received, all these what we call stripes. When Isaiah 53, verse 5 says, By his stripes we are healed. That's not talking about healing us of our ailments. We hear that quoted so many times, talking about being healed of, of sickness. By His stripes we are healed. That word healed there in Hebrew literally means saved. We are healed, but we're healed of our sin. So it's Jesus' beating is what takes our sin away. These stripes take our sin away. But, but after then, after this actual scourging, verses 2 and 3, and after they scourged him, the, the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. And they began to come up to him and say, Hail, King of the Jews, and to give him blows in the face. Now Matthew and Mark give much greater detail of what the soldiers did and what they said. But in both of those accounts, this scene, this mocking Jesus and calling him king, actually the scourging too, takes place after Pilate turns Jesus over to be crucified. So that begs the question, was Jesus scourged twice? And no, I don't I, I don't think he I don't think he was because I don't think any human could live through that twice. But I do think the soldiers had control of him twice. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. And of course, this is, this is conjecture on my part, but it appears in putting the, the four stories together, it appears that once Herod sent Jesus back and Pilate threatened to punish Jesus and release him and then ended up releasing Barnabas, that 
Barabbas. I was afraid I would do that. If I do that and I don't catch it, tell me, because we're teaching on Barnabas here on Sundays. <laughs> Barabbas. Pilate ended up releasing Barabbas. That Pilate tried this. He, he tried this, this thing that we're going to see next. Perhaps, you know, if you read Luke's account and Herod puts that robe on him, you know, Herod makes fun of him. Jesus doesn't even, doesn't even give Herod the time of day. He doesn't say a word. Herod puts his robe on him and sends him back. Here's your king of the Jews. It, it looks like perhaps coming back with that royal robe that Herod sent him back in gave Pilate an idea. Oh, one more thing to try. And so he sent Jesus to be scourged. I don't think at this point the Jews ever saw Jesus wearing this robe. Uh, unless they saw him coming back. Now, it's, it's hard to piece a lot of this together. When Pilate sends Jesus to Herod, there are some of these Jewish leaders that go there and they keep accusing him to Herod. So, unless they came back with Jesus to Pilate, they may have not seen Jesus in that robe. But at any rate, he shows up back at the praetorium wearing this robe. And, and I, I just, in, in my imagination, think that gives Pilate an idea. Matthew tells us that the soldiers stripped Jesus, as we talked about earlier, so they would have taken that robe off of him for the scourging. And then, as John shares here in verse uh, 2, they put the robe back on him, either Herod's robe or another robe. They put a royal robe back on him, which begs, also begs the question, where did they get a royal robe unless it was the one he came back in from Herod's? We, we, we don't really know, but at any rate, they put this robe on him. The word that Matthew uses for robe in this, uh, in in his version of this, is is a is a short robe, like a military robe, like a cape. You know, we wouldn't even have arms, which would be a cape that fastened at the neck and would just hang down a little ways, which would be humiliating on somebody beaten and bloody and bruised and naked and just put this robe over their this this cape over their shoulders. But John describes it as a royal robe, and that's why I lean to thinking it was the one that he came back from Herod's in. And, and then there's that crown of thorns. Like the scourging, both the crown of thorns and the robe are described just matter of factly. They robe they wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. Just facts. This is what they did. And again, we talked about how did John get this information. And, and I think one of some soldier there saw it because it's so matter of fact facts. There's not the kind of detail that John that we, we know John gives. But but the crown. The crown would have been to mimic the laurel crown worn by the Roman emperors. But the picture here, and in actually in all four Gospels, is far greater than that. They thought they were making a statement by putting a, a um, uh, plant-type woven crown on him, wanted to hurt him, so it's the thorns, but it mimics that laurel uh, uh crown that, that the emperors would wear. But the picture is far greater. The first time, you need to pay close attention to any time in Scripture that is the first time a word is used or the first time a concept is used. The first time we see the word thorns in Scripture is in Genesis chapter 3 at the fall when God curses the ground and it says it will bring forth thorns and thistles and Adam has to work the ground and the thorns and thistles and if you fought, you can fall if you've got a, a word search uh, program on your uh, Bible program or if you've got a concordance the old fashioned way to do it and you do a word search on thorns and follow that that thread through scripture it's, a, it's an amazing amazing picture but when God cursed the ground, he said it would bring forth thorns. And any time you see the word thorns in Scripture, it is a picture of sin. 
And so there we have it. Sin wrapped around Jesus' head and crushed into his flesh. So what did the soldiers do? Verse 3 again. And they, and they came up to him and, and they began to say, Hail, King of the Jews, and give him blows in the face. Now this, this, this uh, blows in the face, as, as my translation puts it, that, that's the same word that was used uh, when the temple guard struck Jesus at Annas' house in that very first, um, uh, very first trial. You know, Jesus spoke and that, that temple guard slapped him. It's the same word. This this is this is more of an, an open hand slap than a than a punch with a fist. Perhaps they were or taking out their hatred of the Jews on Jesus. Maybe some of them had gone on that raid the night before when they called out the whole Roman cohort to go arrest this man. Maybe some of them had been there. Perhaps they were saying, "Well, who's the tough guy now?" Maybe they they were. This, this slapping, maybe they did it with one hand, or maybe it, it, the, the tense there is, uh, and to give him blows in the face, indicating that it was more than one. So you think of, you know, a double handed slap like that, a mocking slap, not really intended, not a, not a punch, but just mocking. Who's the tough guy now? And then they called him King of the Jews. How did they know to do that? I mean, they weren't told that when they went out to arrest him the night before. He's just some Galilean preacher. How did they know to call him king of the Jews? Do you think they overheard some of the Jewish leaders? I do. I do. I think... You know, we talk, and here, here again, where we talked about where this information came from for John to write, and we know that these that no criminal, real or imagined, but no criminal, nobody that's accused of something, is going to be left alone with the governor and nobody around. So these are those. Those guys that are kind of in the background, the guards that you see in movies that are standing off in the back, and you know they don't say anything; they just stand there. They were there. They heard this going on. They they heard this this interchange, and so they began calling him, "Hail, King of the Jews." And somebody had to be there that shared this because we we do have detail of the conversation. Verses 4 through, through 6, John shares something that the other Gospels don't even allude to. A lot of times um, we, we will get, they will say something that you, you, if you read between the lines, you'll see where this fits or what it's alluding to. This is not even alluded to anywhere in the other Gospels. So look at verse 4. So Pilate came out again. And he said to them, to the, and I ask you who the they were, that would be the Jewish leaders, said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you. But, I mean, he's not brought Jesus out yet. Jesus is still in the background. I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Now, we don't know if Pilate had been watching this scourging. We don't know uh, where they actually were. He, uh, we've talked about on the map where the uh, Antonia Fortress is, and, and I think that's where Pilate was, and it's somewhere in that, that complex where they did the scourging. And so Pilate may have walked over with them to wherever they did it and watched it. But, but at any rate, he... If it was done somewhere else, I, I, like I said, I tend to think that he did. But, but then he brings Jesus. It's like, now get ready. I'm going to bring him out. And then he gets him and he brings him out. But bloody, bruised, swollen. And John says in verse 5, Jesus therefore came out wearing and and. We don't pick up on this in our English translations, but I read in one of the commentaries 
that the the the, def, the article the is a definite article. It's he came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And then he said, Behold the man. So how did he say it? How do you, how do you imagine him saying this? Was did he say it in pity? Seeking sympathy for Jesus? I mean, look, we've about beaten him to death. Is he saying it uh, in ridicule or mocking? This is what you've been making such a big deal about? Was there desperation in Pilate's voice? Was there anger? Was there taunting? How do you imagine this playing out? When, when Jesus walks out, and Pilate says to the chief priest there, Behold the man. How do you imagine it being said? I think he's exasperated. Exasperated? Are you satisfied now? Are you satisfied now? That's a good one. Anything else? Or I hope you're satisfied. I hope you're satisfied. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, there, there's, like, like Sherry said at the beginning, you know, in a sense you feel sorry for Pilate. Yeah, he, he got himself into this. But he is in such a difficult position. We talked last time, we'll talk more about it in a minute, but we talked last time about some of the, the run-ins that he had had with the Jews. And so there was already a, what is it? He already had a history with them. And so he's, he's dealing with all of that. I, I think it was a mixture of exasperation and desperation. And I, I don't, I, I may be wrong on this, but, but I don't see it so much as a, um, so this is what you were afraid of kind of thing. It, he may have been mocking them. But I see it more, my, my personal opinion, I see it more as, as desperation. But then how did the Jews react to Pilate's words? I mean, they erupted. Look at verse 6. When the chief priests and the officers, and that, here's another thing, if you compare the different accounts of actually who's there, uh, the chief priests, and of course these officers would be some of the temple guard. The funny, or not funny, but interesting thing is in all four Gospels, once they are there at Pilate, we don't see any Pharisees. Pharisees are not mentioned. It's just, just Sadducees, which would be priests, and temple guard who are Levites. But when they saw him, they cried out, Crucify, crucify. And Pilate said to them, Take him. This is why mine is, my translation reads. Yours may be a little different here. Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. And I've not picked up on it. You know, I've always made such a big deal about the two pronouns together, he himself, they themselves, saying that, that any time you see two pronouns together like that, it is that person or that entity making that decision in and of themselves. They themselves. They decided to do this. Nobody made them do it. But I hadn't picked up on this one until I saw it in one of the commentaries. It's two pronouns, but they're not the same. Take him yourselves. You take responsibility for this, is what he is saying. You take responsibility, and you crucify him. Now, did Pilate really expect them to crucify someone? I, I don't think so. Now, some of the commentaries allude to maybe Pilate is giving them permission to do it. But in actuality, I they don't have access. What did we talk about TV programs? Means, motive, and opportunity. They don't have access to do it. They don't have the tools to do it. I think it's it's desperation. I think I think his frustration is beginning to show. And so, the Jews, the chief priests, and some of the temple guard, 
cried out. Uh, and, and one of the questions uh, that I gave you it was look closely at who was calling for Jesus to be crucified. And you, we hear this a lot. I think we talked about, a little bit about it last time. I actually was getting ahead of myself because I knew it was in this lesson. But we've talked a lot or we've heard a lot of things. That you'll hear pastors talk about the same crowd that, that cried Hosanna on Sunday is the same crowd that cried crucified him on Friday. And while there may be some crossover, there may be some there this morning who were there on Sunday morning. I really don't think it's the same crowd of people. These people were there for an entirely different reason. They came early in order to petition for their person to be released or their, the priests and the temple guard. That's, that's the two groups of people. There. The crowds may grow over time. That's why there may be some cross or there may be some there who had seen him come in on Sunday morning, but, but that's not who is, is uh, initiating this on this day. We saw last time how the chief priests stirred up the multitude to clamor for Barabbas. But Pilate is now addressing the chief priests and the temple guard who have either accompanied him back from Herod's or who have come knowing that he is back in Pilate's uh, uh, custody again. And so they reply, it's your job to crucify him. And then verse 7, the Jews answered him, and they are losing control at this point. They say, we have a law, and by that law, he ought to die because he made himself out to be son of God. Had Jesus done that? Had Jesus called himself son of God? Yeah. Yeah. He had several times. My favorite one is in John chapter 5, verse 18. The very I mean, he this is so early in his ministry, he hasn't even chosen his 12 apostles yet. But in chapter 5, in verse 18, it says, For this cause, for this reason, the Jews were con remember all these verbs are in the continuous. I probably beat that to death, but it's so important. The Jews were continually seeking all the more to kill him because he was not only breaking continually, breaking the Sabbath, but was calling continually, ongoing, calling God his own father. And, and I, I, the scriptures I gave you, he did this uh, uh, in 1033. He does it again in chapter 12. I missed getting that one down. But he's done this many times. The claim to be king of the Jews was against Roman law. That's why they changed the charge when they were put on the spot. But to be son of God was a capital offense against Jewish law. That was the real charge to start with back at, at Caiaphas' house. And I think they were so caught up with anger in the moment that they just blurted that out. He made himself out to be son of God. So, now put yourself in Pilate's place. How do you think that hit him? I mean, we talked last time. Jesus went in, they accused him of being king of the Jews, and, and, and Pilate went in and he said, uh, are, you? are you? Are you king of Jews? Remember, he doesn't say, did you say you were? He says, are you? And, and they have a, actually have a discussion there. And Pilate, is like, that, doesn't, that doesn't affect him, and so he's wanting to let Jesus go. But, but it's one thing, king is one thing. Son of God is something else entirely. Look at verse 8. When Pilate heard this statement, he was the more afraid. The Jews, like I said, changed the charge because they thought that blasphemy wouldn't be enough to cause a Roman execution. 
Apparently, they didn't take into account the superstitious nature of the Romans. God men were common in the belief of the Romans, in the Greco-Roman world. Alexander the Great believed that he'd been fathered by a god. Uh, most of the Caesars, almost all the Caesars, believed themselves to be god men. In, uh, in Acts, uh, I think it's in Acts 14, when Peter and Barnabas, get the right one there, when they go into Lystra and, and the, uh, the people don't speak their language and they think, they, call, they think their gods come down to earth. So th this, this whole Roman Greco world was filled with superstition. And when they said this, on top of everything else that Pilate had already seen, he had, if Jesus was a God-man, and he just had him scourged, and couple that with that note from his wife in Matthew about that dream she had, that would be enough to make him the more afraid, wouldn't you think? So now Pilate takes Jesus back into the praetorium and he begins to question him again. But any comments or questions on this section before we go on to Pilate and Jesus? Okay, look at verse 9. And he entered into the praetorium again and said to Jesus, where are you from? He takes Jesus in. Jesus is still, nothing's changed about how Jesus looks. He's still got this robe on. He's still beaten and bloody. I mean, <coughs> excuse me. Just imagine how he may look. And he takes him probably roughly by the arm and drags him back in and he says, where are you from? He doesn't say, where were you born? Excuse me, he doesn't say, where is your home? He says, where are you from? How did Jesus answer? He didn't. He didn't say a thing. He didn't say anything. Why? <coughs> Pilate has already rejected everything that Jesus has said to him. What's the point? Of saying anymore. But I imagine, maybe this is just my imagination, but perhaps Jesus gave him a look. Perhaps Jesus' look said it all. Particularly because of what Pilate said next. There had to be something. I, I, I don't imagine, the way I view this in my mind, I don't imagine Pilate asking Jesus there, and Jesus just standing there with his head down. I imagine he gave Pilate a look. And Pilate... He yeah, he wouldn't have believed him anyway. So what's the point? But with that look, Pilate then erupted. And he, he said to him, You do not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you? And I have authority to crucify you? I mean, he's not getting anywhere with the Jewish leaders. And Jesus is beat half to death, and so he feels a little free to, to say some of the things he might not say otherwise. Pilate indeed had the authority. But even though he believed that Jesus was innocent, he didn't have the backbone to release it. He may have had the authority to do it, but he didn't have the will to do it. So look at what Jesus said about Pilate's so-called authority. Jesus said, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. Every time I read that, every time I read of something being given to someone, I, I'm reminded of, of when we studied the book of Revelation. And that, that was a phrase that jumped out at me in that study of Revelation. How many times something was given to someone else. It just, uh, you, you start just reading 
skim reading over Revelation, just marking every time you see that, you'll be amazed. Everything comes from God. God gave, gives authority. God gives ability. God gives keys. God gives, God gives, God gives all the way through that. Whether it's authority, good gifts, or judgment, everything comes from God. And Daniel reminded Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 2.21 that it is God who removes kings and sets up kings. And i tell you what, I hold to that sometimes. <laughs> Just, that should give us great comfort to hold to that. But then what about the second part of that verse? For this reason, Jesus goes on to say, for this reason, he who delivered me up to you has the greater sin. So who do you think he's referring to? The Jewish leaders accept that, and of course this won't show up in our English translations, except it's a singular. The one is a singular. Caiaphas. A lot of people will say Judas. Judas was a pawn. Judas, Judas had no authority other than, well again, what was given to him. But he was a pawn in this whole thing. Caiaphas. Caiaphas in his position as high priest represented the people to God. Even if he wasn't supposed to be the high priest, even if he was evil, it didn't make any difference. He held that position. And by holding that position, he was responsible. It was the position that had the responsibility, not the man who held the position. The position of high priest and is holding that position, Caiaphas. You might say the buck stopped with him. Caiaphas was responsible for this. And, and this, this part's my opinion, you know, and I always tell you when it's just simply my opinion. My opinion is, is that I believe Caiaphas knew that Jesus was the Messiah. I, I just believe that he did. But he thought he could defeat him. He thought he could handle I mean, he thought, well, who's that stupid? Well, there was this one angel that thought he could be better than God, you know. He, I, I believe he knew. But he thought he could defeat him. He, he didn't want to lose his position, his power, or most importantly, his possessions. Remember? They were very wealthy. The high priesthood, uh, Caiaphas and the high priesthood through Annas had amassed great wealth by their coin exchange, by their selling of sacrifices, by all of that, that, that whole money changer thing that you know Jesus cleared out. Annas was worried about his money and Caiaphas was too and his position. It reminds me of Revelation 11 when the Antichrist has the two witnesses killed and he thinks, that's that. And of course, three days later, they're resurrected again. But Caiaphas knew, or Caiaphas thought that he could have Jesus killed and that would be it. That would be the end of it. And I believe he knew, again, I believe he knew who Jesus was, but he only cared about himself. So Caiaphas, I believe, may have carried the greater weight for the guilt, but the ball is in Pilate's court. And Pilate wants it out. Look at verse 12. As a result of this, Pilate made efforts. Now, that's in the continuous verb. He kept trying. He kept trying, made efforts to release him. Uh, I'll hold that there for just a second. We're not told, of course, but but the way this is worded, and and he's he's. Well, let me go ahead and read the rest of, of verse twelve. He made efforts to release him, but the Jews, these chief priests and, and officers, they cried out, saying, "If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar." So imagine how this is how I imagine this takes place. Pilate goes out to them, leaves Jesus inside, 
goes out to them and announces that he is going to release Jesus. He made, uh, let me find that again, he made efforts to release him. I think he goes out and says, I'm going to release him and there's not a thing you can do about it. And I imagine him announcing that and then turning to go back inside and when he does that, then the Jews shout this out. If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. And you can imagine that stopping him in his tracks and the blood draining from his face. Maybe feeling just a little weak need for a moment. That's the ultimate, ultimate threat. This is another one of those great ironies that we that John has shared with us. Not only had the Jews been guilty of breaking a law, but now their intense hatred of Rome was set aside and they brought accusation against Pilate for not being a friend of Caesar's. I mean, nobody hated Rome more than they did, but they wanted to keep the uh, things on an even keel. They didn't want their apple cart upset. They wanted things to go on as normal. And Jesus was upsetting things. They, they hated Rome, but they hated Jesus more. And so they, they said this, brought this accusation against Pilate for not being a friend of Caesar. And you know, we might read that and think, you know, third grade. You're not my friend anymore. But that was actually a title. To be a friend of Caesar's was a political title. And apparently, Pilate had this title, but he was on the verge of losing it. Political titles were, then and now, were very important. <laughs> it was funny, as I was reading through this, I, I looked at J. Vernon McGee's commentary, and he said, uh, he said Pilate was just a cheap politician. That pretty well calls it. But we, as I said, we talked last time about those numerous run-ins that Pilate had had with the Jews and all the reports that had gone to Rome. Tattletailing. All these reports that had gone to Rome. Tiberius, who was Caesar at the moment, like most Roman emperors, well, actually like almost anyone who's in any position of power, was very suspicious of any attempt to take away that power. If anybody's going to mess with the power, they're going, they're going to get rid of them. Pilate already knew that he was on thin ice. And he didn't dare take a chance of something else being reported to Rome about his opposing Caesar, let alone saying he's not a friend of Caesar and, and especially a word of, of his letting someone off the hook that was king of the Jews that was going to be king. That couldn't happen. And I, I firmly believe that Pilate knew, believed who Jesus was. I believe that he was afraid of Jesus. But he was more afraid of Caesar. He was afraid of Jesus. He was afraid of God. But he was, he was more afraid of the threat in front of him of one that might possibly come about. But it seems that the Jews now have regained their composure and, and they return to the original accusation of the king. That that uh, son of God thing just kind of slipped out in the heat of the moment. And that's kind of brushed aside. We're, we're back to accusing him of being king again. Because they still think, they still reason that the charge of being a king carries more weight. They, they don't have a clue, I don't think, of how scared Pilate was. Of Son of God. And so they go back to the original title. And by now, though, I think Pilate has had it. Verse 13, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out. He went in, he grabs him, he brought him out, sat down on the judgment seat. And just, just to throw this out, uh, does every, everybody's translation put it that way? He brought Jesus out and then sat down on the judgment seat. Everybody sort of read the same way there. There, there was a commentary or two that, that alluded to that he may have brought Jesus out and sat him down on the judgment seat. Here's your king kind of thing. I don't know. It just 
I think Pilate sat down is, is the way that I read that. Not to say that it couldn't be the other way. And again, if he did, how ironic would that be that he will ultimately be the judge? But, but I think it was Pilate. It brought him out, sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, but in Hebrew it's called uh, Gabathia. I guess is how you pronounce that. And then John, like he often does, adds, a, just throws in this, this bit of extra information. I mean, I, I don't know why he had to, uh, why he called the name of the place, the pavement. They may have understood. There may have been somebody there who understood what that was, that understood where that place was. That, that doesn't carry a lot of weight for us or be uh, what it's called in Hebrew. But then he says in verse 14, now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It, this would be like he was John was saying, now it was Passover Eve. Just like you and I say, it's Christmas Eve. The day before Christmas. It's the day before the Passover. And then he says, and it was about the sixth hour. And I asked you about the sixth hour. And uh, commentaries are all over the place about this. If you, if, any thoughts on that? What, what do you think? Why did, not only why did John say it, but when is it? Jew, in a Jewish reckoning, it would be noon. But then, according to Matthew and Mark, Jesus is already on the cross at noon. That's when it goes dark. That's, that's what the note in my Bible says. That's what I had always thought. I had always understood it in it that when John is writing his gospel, the temple has already been destroyed by this time. Uh, the, the, uh, the sacrifices have ended. And so everything in John's gospel speaks to Roman time. And that it, it is that in almost all the cases. But studying this and, and all these different commentaries, and they're all over the place on it, I thought I had a handle on what it was, but now I'm not so sure. I do believe that it refers to the hour between 6 and 7. I believe that they took Jesus to, uh, uh, to the official trial in the temple. As, as I mean, they were waiting for the clock to strike 6. I mean, when it was day. I mean, as, as, as soon as they could officially do it. I believe that happened at 6 o'clock. I believe that didn't take more than 15 or 20 minutes. Then I believe they brought him to Pilate. But with all this between Pilate and to Herod and back to Pilate and the scourging, it's wild to think that that only took about an hour. So I, in, in my own notes, I can poke, theory, poke holes in my own theories there. So I guess we'll just have to leave that one there. I have to, have to go to somebody else on that one. But whatever it is, whatever it is that John feels it's important to share that, there is an important reason. It's one of those things that I just really don't know the answer to yet. But then when he says that, he goes back to the actual event and tells us that Pilate said, he, Pilate, said to the Jews, Behold your king. And I think this is said in an entirely different way than when he said, Behold the man earlier. Behold your king. All this talk about Jesus as God has been left behind now. That was just a blip on the radar. I think Pilate has brushed that aside. The Jews hope they brushed it aside. They don't want to go down that road. They don't want to talk about it. Pilate certainly doesn't want to talk about it. And so he says, Behold your king. And it seems here that Pilate may have regained his composure or at least regained the upper hand. He thinks he's in control. And then the dialogue continues, verse 15. And they cry out, the, the Jews cry out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate says to them, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered we have no king but Caesar.
they actually, both sides have lost control. Pilots lost control. They've lost control. Jews have lost control. By saying that, what law did the Jews break? You shall have no other gods before me. Which they have said they do. So what sin have they committed? Blasphemy. Blasphemy. The very sin that they had accused Jesus of. Ironic how that comes around. So now we come to Pilate's final action, verse 16. So he delivered him to them, that would be to the soldiers, to be crucified. As I pointed out in your lesson, this is where we need to add in the actions of the soldiers. Particularly uh, the things that, that Matthew and Mark mention. Since Jesus and Pilate's conversation in verse 11, Jesus is still apparently still wearing that robe. I mean, nothing has said about putting his clothes back on him. He's still wearing that robe, whether it's the robe that came from Pilate, whether it was the uh, the military robe, and he's, he's naked except for that. We, we don't know. Whatever it is, he's still wearing that robe and that crown of thorns from when it was presented to the Jews originally. Matthew then, in Matthew 27, verse 31, tells us that the soldiers took Jesus to be crucified him, or to be crucified, and they mocked him, which tells us they mocked him again. They didn't scourge him twice, but they mocked him twice. They mocked him when they were scourging him, and now you can imagine as they are dragging him out, barely able to walk, still dressed this way, they begin to mock him again. And then, because this is real, this is literal, after they mocked him, Matthew tells us that they took the robe and crown off of him and let him put, put his own clothes back on him and led him away to be crucified. Okay, now, this is real. This is real life. Real, physical person. Jesus had been scourged. We talked about what all that entailed. His skin was torn. He was raw and he was bleeding and he was bruised and he was swollen and then he was prated out in front of these Jews wearing these robes and he stood there for, I don't know, 20, 25 minutes or so. Well, what's going to happen to a wound if you have a, a fabric on it and you stand still and that fabric is not disturbed for 20 minutes or so? It stinks. And I don't think they gently took that robe off of him. The blood would begin to dry at least some of it and stick to the fabric. And then they ripped it off. And the wounds would be pulled open again. And then the soldiers put his own clothes back on him and led him out. And so then verse 17 continues. They, that would be the soldiers, took Jesus therefore and he went out. Bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which again John gives us this detail, is called in Hebrew Galgotha. And verse 18, and there they crucified him. And with him, two other men, one on either side and Jesus in between. And who, who, who was that middle cross for? Barabbas. As I said in your lesson, John gives us the least amount of info of all the Gospels for what happens here. But you know the story. The Gospels don't give us the details, but we can find a lot of this in prophecy. And I'm just, just pulling out a few things. I mean, there's a ton of it. But he went out. It says he went out with them. Isaiah 53, 7 says that he went out like a lamb that is led to slaughter. In John 10, 11, Jesus himself would say that the shepherd would lay down his life for the sheep. 
He carried his own cross. Of course, the other Gospels give us much more detail on that. But in Genesis 22, verse 6, we see Isaac carrying the wood for the sacrifice. The crucifixion took place, if you look look on your, your map, and you don't have to look it up, but there's two different places there where, where the crucifixion could have been. There's a traditional site um, uh, kind of to the, to the left, and then Gordon's Calvary, which is to the top. The more traditional site is the one where I, I think it was. But it, you'll notice it's outside the, the, the walls of the city. Now, there's another set of walls around there, but that's added much later. At the time that Jesus was crucified, just that yellow portion is all that, that would where the walls would have been. The crucifixion took place outside the city, and that fulfilled the Old Testament law of Exodus 29, 14, that said the sin offering was to be taken outside the camp. And in Hebrews 13, 11, and 12, tells us that Jesus did indeed suffer outside the gate as an offering for sin. So, so, many, so many more Old Testament prophecies, but Jesus fulfilled all the pictures. But then Pilate did one more thing. He took the Jews' own words and wrote the charge, but he, but he changed it a little. And had it put on the cross, verse 19. And Pilate wrote an inscription also and put it on the cross. And it was and it was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. Verse 20 then tells us that therefore this inscription, many of the Jews read for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. This was actually on what you and I would call the main drag. And the Romans chose that because of, of the traffic for everybody coming and going to see it as a deterrent to anybody else doing the things of, of whoever was being crucified there was being crucified for. And that's the reason they put the charge above their head. We're not told that, that the other two had the charge of insurrection above them. I, I don't think it may be, but, but it would have been. The charge was always above, so anybody coming through would read it. The charge was normally written in Greek, the language uh, the, the, the language that everybody would read. But Pilate decided to write this in Hebrew and Latin and in Greek. Why do you think all three? So whoever was there could read it. I mean, the Romans... Theoretically, everybody should have been able to read it if it was in Greek. Theoretically, everybody should be able to read Greek because that was the, the language of commerce. It is like English today. If anybody wants to do business, even in another country, with those arrogant Americans, they, they, they speak English because we don't know their language. Because he was born and came to the Jews. That, that's, a, that's an underlying reason. That's a good point. He is that. Yeah, and I had a note in my Bible that says, see Acts chapter 2. Okay, what's that got to do with anything? So I'll turn over to Acts chapter 2. And you remember in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit falls on people, that they speak in different languages. And so the, um, the critic says, no, they didn't really speak in different languages. All they had to do is speak in Greek because everybody would know Greek. No, there was a reason they spoke in all these different languages, not only languages, but dialects. And there's a reason that although everybody coming through could read Greek, there was a reason that he gave all three languages. Hebrew represented religion, the Jewish religion. Latin, things that were written in Latin were official things. You know, in Catholicism for many, many years, all of Mass, I guess, yet yeah, the, the, the program, the, the service was done in Latin, and only the, the priest would know what was being said. Latin was the uh, official language of Rome, it was a legal language. So you had religion and, and you had Roman law, and Greek represented culture or commerce. It wasn't just so everyone could read it, but that everyone would fully understand the ramifications of it. If it was just written in Greek, it could just be an accusation. True or not. I mean, he's been killed for it, so it must be true, but 
true or not, but it's written in all three. So the ramifications of all three would be no. Did the Jews like that? No, they didn't. Verses 21 and 22. So the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, apparently somebody traveling in went and told them. They thought, okay, he's going to be crucified. Wash my hands of this. Let me get on with the business of the day. Let me get back to, to Passover and get ready for Passover. And somebody comes in and says, hey, you know that guy that was being crucified? You won't believe what kind of charge they put on him. Here they go again. They go to Pilate. We can't have this. Do not write. Do not put the king of the Jews. Put, he said, I am king of the Jews. And Pilate's had it at this point. What I have written, I have written. One last jab over this whole event that he had, had so horribly lost control of. We said at the beginning, Pilate tried many times and many ways to get out of crucifying Jesus. He tried to dodge the responsibility by sending Jesus to Herod, and that didn't work. He tried to appease the crowd, and that didn't work. He tried to compromise, and that didn't work. And finally, he just gave in. But to save just a shred of dignity, at least in his own eyes, he stood strong on this. What I have written, I have written. Why did he stand so strong on this while vacillating on crucifying Jesus or releasing Jesus? Because he believed it. He believed that Jesus was... I think the charge, it went back to that, you know, other than Son of God. I think he grabbed hold of that charge and held on to it and says... I'm going to make myself believe that that's what it's all about. But but think about any any other ideas on life stood so strong on this and was so weak on everything else. Wasn't it quite an ordeal to reverse something that the governor put in place? Yeah, yeah, that that yeah. It, he, he stood strong on that. They could not change it. But why did he stand strong on that? Uh, maybe because they couldn't change it, but... One last ditch effort in his conscience. One last ditch effort. Exactly. Yeah, maybe mocking the Jews. Mocking the Jews. Exactly. But I'll tell you something else. Why? Another reason I think that he stood so strong on this, and that was because it didn't cost him anything. That didn't cost him a thing. We'll all stand strong on an issue that doesn't cost us anything. But yet maybe compromise when the cost is more than we're willing to pay. The question that arises for everyone, Pilate included, is what will you do with Jesus? And that's a question that every one of us has to answer. What will you do? With Jesus. So, any thoughts or comments? Questions? Do you know what happened to Pilate? I read he killed himself. There, uh, there's a lot of different um, writings on, on what happened. That that was one of them. There, there is the legend that he became a Christian, but there's no evidence of that. That's just a story. But there are, um, uh, he was re uh, relieved of duty here uh, a few years after this. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't remember if it was, all, if there was another incident that, that caused it or if it was just a change. And, and it, it, he, he actually, he was, whatever it was, he was to report to Tiberius. On his way back by ship to Rome, Tiberius died in the meantime. And so he dodged that bullet. But um, uh, And I, I don't remember exactly what happened to him after that, but I think you're right. I, I have read that he that he killed himself. So, uh, you know, this may have been something that he just he just couldn't couldn't ever shake off. Any other thoughts or questions? 
Next time we will, uh, we'll, we'll, it's going to watch for this as you do the next lesson. Watch for the detail John gives. We pick back up again with John's eyewitness detail. You'll see it as you start reading it. So let's pray. Father, what a, what a powerful and intense section of Scripture. 